Hello, everybody, and welcome to Schwab Coaching. Our next topic is our weekly edition of Jeff's World with Schwab's Chief Global Investment Strategist, Jeff Freekwintop. Good morning, Jeff. Morning, Lee. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Lee Bowl. Before we can get going with all of Jeff's insights, just a few logistical items we need to address. Uh, send in your questions in the chat. We'll keep an eye on that. And also, we have some written disclosures. Keep in mind that everything we're doing today should be considered as educational and informational in nature only. Nothing should be construed as a personalized trading recommendation. As far as past performance, remember past performance is never a guarantee of future success. Any opinions could change based on changing market conditions. Also, investing does have risks, including loss of principal. And finally, if we talk anything about technical analysis, Schwab certainly does not recommend the use of technical analysis as your sole method of investment research. Now that that's out of the way, Jeff, what are you watching this week? Well, there's a lot going on. We've got speeches and meetings by central bankers, which we know can move markets. We get inflation readings in Europe. We've got growth data on China. And we've got your job reports here in the U.S. and Canada on Friday. So there's a lot you need to know for the week ahead. Now, the central bankers could move the market this week. There's going to be a lot of Fed speakers at various events around the country. I think every member of the FOMC seems to be speaking somewhere this week. And we get the minutes from the latest meetings from the Reserve Bank of Australia, uh, the European Central Bank and Sweden's Central Bank, and also a business outlook from the Bank of Canada. So that could give us some sense around maybe when that first rate cut's going to be and maybe how many might follow thereafter. Also, India's Central Bank meets for the last time before India's elections this week. Uh, we've got inflation in the Eurozone for March due on Wednesday, and that's likely to have taken another step closer to the European Central Bank's 2% target in March. Economists are expecting it to come down to 2.5% from 2.6 last month. That's really close to two, and that makes a June interest rate cut increasingly look like a done deal. The debate among policymakers probably has shifted more to um, towards how many rate cuts will follow that first June cut this year. In the press conference at the March ECB meeting, President Lagarde seemed to hint that the Governing Council expected to cut at no more than four meetings this year. With four meetings scheduled to follow the one in June, the minutes will be closely examined to see if any further insight into how rapidly those cuts may be made uh, once they begin uh, this summer. We also get some China economic data. We got the March PMIs, which uh, showing the economy improved a little bit here in the month of, of March, though really responding to uh, stronger export demand, domestic demand still looks fairly weak. So a lot of the stimulus in China really helping to prop up um, uh, production, <clears throat> not doing much for demand. Firms returning after work uh, to work after the Lunar New Year probably help boost uh, production as well there. And then on Friday, we're going to get the U.S. Uh, and Canadian employment reports for March after the February unemployment rate in the U.S. climbed to a two-year high. Forecasts for economists are calling for a gain of about 205,000 jobs being created uh, on a net basis in the month of March, and that is a little lower than February's number of 275,000. Canada is expected to see a gain of 34,000 jobs after last month's 41,000, so expecting to slow in both countries a little bit. Still, the unemployment rate may rise to 5.9% in Canada versus 58 last month on a growing immigrant labor force. And of course, I mentioned that China PMI data, I think it's gonna get a lot of attention today. Um, <clears throat> We saw manufacturing in the official numbers from China's government, National Statistics Bureau, jumped up to 50.8 from 49.1. That's a big leap, and it's above that 50.0 threshold between growth and recession in manufacturing. Now, I like to focus on the private sector produced uh, Kaishin manufacturing PMI that's produced by S&P Global, same as the one in the US and the UK and Europe and, and, and Japan and everywhere else. And that came in at 51.1. So that supports this growth reading of, uh, of manufacturing moving back into growth territory. On the surface, again, this is good news, but it it's really focused on China producing a greater supply of goods, but there's still very weak domestic demand to absorb it all tied to the weakening property markets. For for example, if we look at what was uh, what the numbers were for industrial output in January and February, they rose to 7.7% year over year. That was up from 7.1 in December, but 
In contrast, and importantly, growth of retail sales slowed to 5.5% in January and February, down from 7.4% in December. So the point there is that consumption domestically within China is still weak. So these signs of better PMI data and, and manufacturing ticking up over the threshold of 50.0 back into growth really is just speaking to more supply, not more demand, and that could continue to weigh on prices. Well, then what can China do to kind of stimulate that demand side of the equation then? Yeah, that's the big question. I mean, it really all comes down to policy. Japanese officials have communicated policy changes to the markets pretty effectively here with the, the most recent uh, Bank of Japan move, which really helped the country maintain its place as the world's strongest performing stock market this year, uh, as measured by the Nikkei 225 index. In India, also in Asia, has been transparent in its policy initiatives, maintaining its place as the world's strongest performing economy this year. <laughs> in fact, India's growth momentum, uh, GDP accelerated 8.4% year over year in the fourth quarter of 2023. That was the third consecutive quarter of growth over 8%. So India has been communicating its policy well, uh, keeping its economy strong. Japan's been doing it, keeping its stock market strong. But of Asia's big three economies, the exception is clearly China when it comes to policy clarity, where the stock market is among the weakest and the economy remains under pressure. You know, one of the big challenges for investors is figuring out policy changes, which tend to have a really big impact on China's economy in recent years. We all remember zero COVID rules uh, and then the crackdown on their big tech companies, the restrictions on leverage of property developers. All that seemed to come with no warning and little clarity. Much of the recent pressure on China's stock market began in 2020, concurrent with that new government policy on um, cracking down on the buildup of leverage in the housing industry and to curb housing speculation. And the result starved some of these developers of capital like Evergrande and Country Garden. Recent measures, policy changes to revive China's economy have really been a very slow drip of policies that have been ineffective, um, seen by markets as reactive and uncoordinated and targeted, too specific rather than prompt and broad. And they've not been sufficient to support a sustainable turnaround in consumer confidence, which remains very low. Uh, I put together a chart here of consumer confidence just to show how weak it is because of the the, the biggest property, uh, the biggest asset uh, consumer zone is property. And it's just all prices have been falling here uh, 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 in terms of all the different property markets around China. You can see how low consumer confidence is way below any of the other downturns we've seen over the last 20 plus years in China, really pinned at very deep pessimistic lows, really uh, um, uh, explaining that very weak demand picture within within China. All right. Well, uh, if, if I recall, the Chinese market kind of made a, a low in, in January of 2022. I can see of January 22nd, rather. Uh, yeah. You think it's you think that is the low or what do you what should we think about that? It's, it's possible. I mean, Chinese stocks are very cheap, but sentiment remains pessimistic. China's stocks are flat so far in 2024, even though they've bounced about 13% since, uh, since uh, mid to late January. Valuations are close to 20-year lows. Um, you can see I put this chart together. There's been some green shoots with better than expected export growth in the combined January and February data and indeed in the PMI data that came out overnight. Uh, supported by the global manufacturing recovery, that cardboard box recovery we've been talking about. But, I mean, you can just see how the stocks are just really pinned at 20-year lows here in terms of valuations, single-digit price-to-earnings ratios. China's economic growth is likely to remain muted, though, due to the weight of the property market slowdown and very modest fiscal support. While policymakers around the world are looking at rate cuts to stimulate growth, high interest rates aren't really been what ails China's economy. It's weak consumer business and investor confidence. Uh, and there are also the trade risks that we've talked about on the show recently with our impact on the 2024 elections. So, you know, we've got a, a backdrop here that's really a very pessimistic environment for consumers, businesses, and investors. It's very hard to break that and turn it around. All right. So uh, back to my previous question then with that insight, what can they do to, to turn things around to make a rally more sustainable? 
Well, I've got a few ideas. First, on March 5th, uh, we previewed this uh, on this show, China's premier delivered the government work report to the National People's Congress. This is an annual event where they lay out the GDP target for the year. In this case, it was set at about 5%, the same as last year. But usually, they announce some policy initiatives as to how they're going to get there. This year, they didn't. They said support was needed on, quote, all fronts, but they really failed to announce any major new policy initiatives. Chinese policymakers left the fiscal deficit unchanged. They avoided any major moves to boost consumption, and they gave very few specifics on how they were going to solve the real estate crisis. And it's our belief that without further support, China's economy and market uh, may continue to struggle to show really any signs of momentum. So I can think of a few unexpected policy changes that China could announce at any time to sustainably revive its economy and stock market. I don't put necessarily high odds on these in the near term, but there are a few things they could do that would really shock the market and the economy into a, a, an improving outlook. First, a government guarantee of home buyer deposits at troubled property developers. I've talked about that before on this show. That could really help boost economic growth by turning around consumer confidence from its recession-like lows. Homeowners who put down big deposits with developers to build a home are now worried about not getting their home or not getting their money back from those failing developers, which seems to have prompted them to pull back on their spending overall. There's a lot of pent-up savings in China, and it continues to grow, and it could be unleashed to the benefit of China's economy and businesses, particularly the banks and real estate companies, and the global consumer product makers with exposure to Japan or exposure to China, uh, particularly European luxury good producers. If they could just get this figured out, guarantee those deposits at those troubled uh, um, uh, uh, property developers, and get people spending again. Uh, that I think is the lowest hanging fruit. It probably wouldn't even cost them that much to do. Uh, and, and would really mark a, a sharp turnaround. No signs that they're ready to do that. Second, I think loosening capital controls could help boost stocks by easing the ability of cash-rich companies to do share buybacks. So China has very strict rules regarding moving money in or out of the country, these capital restrictions. And that makes doing share buybacks challenging because most of the earnings of these big companies that generate a lot of cash in mainland China are listed in New York or Hong Kong. The stock market values, in fact, as some of these Chinese, just giant Chinese companies, including like Alibaba and Baidu and JD.com, they're approaching the amounts of cash and equivalents on their balance sheet, despite their being profitable and growing companies. So they're literally almost just worth the cash they're holding, as if their whole you know, business operation wasn't worth anything. And that might be due to the perception that the Chinese government could announce a policy change at any time that can impose a costly new fine or a tax or regulation. So I think loosening capital controls could boost confidence by shareholders in the cash stockpiles held by many of these Chinese companies you can see on the screen here that they would get distributed to the shareholders rather than risk being plundered by some policy change. So I think that's something they could also announce. Again, I don't necessarily see policy change on capital controls coming right around the corner, but it's something that could surprise the markets and really lead to a sharp turnaround. <coughs> and third, excuse me, <clears throat> I still get the scoff. Third, measures to reduce government regulations and encourage entrepreneurship could support business confidence. You know, years of these abrupt policy changes with tough regulations imposed on <clears throat> everything from educational tutoring to video game developers to business consultants, mobile app creators, among others, may have left established businesses and entrepreneurs just feeling that they're in an unsupported environment. The latest ruling from Beijing requires all mobile app providers to submit their business details to the government. It's just one example of policies that write that may just stifle innovation. Reversing some of those regulations could mean fostering a more innovative environment. And you can see that in the performance of video game developers in late December when a regular regulatory proposal was rescinded that would have required them to implement measures to cap user spending on games and ban excessive rewards. The original response to the proposal caused a plunge in China's gaming stocks. Out of nowhere, this regulation came into place <clears throat> and you saw uh, stock prices really plunge. Uh, that's been rescinded now. The stocks are back up. China's regulators followed that up by approving more new game titles each month since that shift in policy. NetEase, one of China's biggest gaming companies, rebounded 40% from its lows following the policy change, just as an example. So 
Uh, so those are three things. One, you know, a more uh, business friendly environment on uh, supporting uh, I innovation entrepreneurship. Uh, two, loosening capital controls. And in that first one I mentioned, uh, putting those guarantees in place on those homeowner uh, home buyer deposits uh, at those troubled property developers. Those three things, I think, um, even one of them would make a big difference in China's stock market and its and its uh, economic outlook. But I got to say, right now, there's no signs of any major imminent shift in policy in China. But again, it's worth keeping in mind that China's policymakers rarely signal these kind of changes in advance. So any surprises could potentially trigger sharp rebounds in China's stock market, like in late 2022 when the zero COVID restrictions were suddenly dropped and China's stocks shot up 60%, six zero over the subsequent three month period. You can see it in this chart here. It just kind of came out of nowhere. The expectation was they would very slowly begin to ease zero COVID policies. And instead they just basically switched them off overnight and stocks rebounded sharply and then ran into some of those troubles uh, beginning with uh, that uh, uh, hot air balloon, the spy balloon uh, uh, that uh, uh, was uh, detected over U.S. airspace there in early January, and then that compounded with the property problems, and the stock is, stock market has just uh, plunged since there. So I think until we see changes in these policies, if we get them at all, China may remain a drag on the emerging market index, and a key reason the emerging market stocks remain less attractive to us than those in developed international markets. Well, so what are the odds, though, that things could just begin to improve on their own, sort of organically? Well, yeah, I mean, the PMI data was a pleasant surprise to see. So I guess seeing more like that would be helpful. What we're looking for in the forthcoming March data over the you know next couple of weeks and, and, and really over the coming months are signs that domestic demand is gaining tr key traction, not just supply. Uh, from producers, but but demand from consumers. And the key indications would be an improvement in consumption backed by stronger job and income growth and signs that property activity is finally bottoming out. China's policymakers manufacturing focused stimulus strategy is thus far not taking comprehensive measures in either of those two areas, which is a key reason why we remain cautious about China's broad macro outlook, primarily for stocks. Interesting. Um... Let's look at some questions. Do you think that the, we have a question here in the queue. Can you just speak a little bit about our budget deficit and, you know, who's worried about it? I mean, everybody talks about it, but they don't seem to be doing much about it. And how does that affect the markets here, do you think? And does it have any international uh, overtones? So what we've seen in the in the past, when we see governments begin to respond to the amount of of, of debt and, and the, how rapidly they're growing it, it usually shows up in currency weakness before it shows up in interest rates. Uh, we often think, oh, well, interest rates are going to spike up, but not necessarily when you've got a central bank that uh, is somewhat in control of longer term interest rates. <clears throat> Generally, what we've seen, particularly in big economies like Japan, where the central bank is in control of interest rates, you see the currency begin to weaken when the markets decided. It's had enough, and in order to force the world to buy any more U.S. debt, because remember the Fed isn't buying any more of it, so we've got to get the rest of the world to buy our treasuries. Um, <clears throat> sure, rates have gone up, but in order to encourage more and more interest, you've got to give them a discount, and that usually comes in the form of a weaker dollar. We haven't really seen that yet. Um, the dollar's sort of stabilized this year. Uh, <clears throat> it has uh, uh, risen just a little bit uh, early in the year, but I'm looking uh, just right now. So the dollar's up 3.6% this year. I mean, that's not a sign that the world is abandoning U.S. backed debt or, or uh, you know, U.S. backed uh, investments or assets. So I would say that <clears throat> keep a close eye on the dollar as that begins to, we believe that should begin to soften up later this year, both on the trade and budgetary imbalances, uh, and that might begin to show up. We don't expect a rout in the dollar, but beginning to see a decline there would be a sign that maybe uh, uh, congressional leaders begin to take more seriously the consequences of, of this very rapid debt growth. And in general, <clears throat> that's what we've seen turn things around around the world. When the currency begins to plunge, that raises domestic inflation for any imported goods. Uh, you know, it becomes a real issue for uh, for consumers. Right now, you know, when you're talking about 
billions and then trillions and then quadrillion, you know, you just sort of lose sight of what that really means. But you start to feel it when you see the currency come down and maybe inflation begin to revive again. That can begin to happen later this year. So something we need to keep a, a close eye on. That's, I think, the canary in the coal mine. That's something that we saw in Japan uh, as they you know, started to really excessively increase their debt relative to the size of their economy. You really saw the currency weaken uh, as in response to that. So that's where I keep a, a close eye on it. Again, we believe that might be going to show up later this year, but hasn't been a problem so far. Okay, can you fill us in on any developments with the trade situation or, uh, you know, sending emissaries back and forth? Are relations, you know, thawing a little bit in your view between China and the U.S.? Or, I mean, we saw that, uh, you know, the, the GOP candidate, you know, wants to have 100 percent tariffs on EVs from uh, from China. So is that really a threat or? Is it all talking, do you think? Well, what's the real status now with the trade with China? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think there's a real threat. I, I, you know, as we look across the elections, and I wrote a piece on this on Schwab.com, uh, on the elections of 2024, and it isn't even just the U.S. election that's leaning in the direction of greater trade frictions, but it's uh, the European parliamentary elections this summer. Uh, you know, India's got elections coming up in, in April and May. India's uh, historically, you know, somewhat protectionist when it comes to policy moves. Uh, you've got the UK election coming up this fall, or in this winter. <clears throat> you've got a lot of elections around the world where I think the shift is more towards nationalism and putting, quote, quote, unquote, my country first. And the consequence of that is that, you know, when... Uh, when we saw tariffs go up on China in 2018, it didn't really result in a major increase in inflation or generalized tariffs around the world because they were relatively easy to get around. Uh, you could just export, you know, uh, China could just export through uh, Vietnam or Cambodia or, you know, another country and 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 then pass that on to the U.S. and, and effectively avoid, uh, we, we would avoid paying those tariffs. That's going to be much harder if a lot of countries begin to put up these barriers. And so, you know, there might be different approaches depending on who wins the election, but we're clearly moving in the direction of greater trade frictions. And so it does concern me. I did write a piece on that potential inflationary consequences of all of that and the potential negative impact to manufacturing production. Remember, it isn't just uh, putting uh, you know, a, a tariff on, on something made in China. China will then reciprocate and put a tariff on things made in the U.S. There are a lot of companies in the U.S. that depend a lot on sales to China. Um, you know, there are many companies with substantial amounts of their sales tied to, to Chinese uh, production. So that's uh, an issue around the world. And we're seeing that with our even trade partners like Europe. Um, and there's even the potential for the U.S. Uh, Mexico Canada agreement, which uh, you know was was uh, uh, brought about to replace NAFTA in Trump's first term, that will be reviewed again uh, coming up uh, in just a few years under the new presidents in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and that's in an environment of much uh, less friendly trade relations. So that could uh, see greater trade frictions among our biggest trade partners, Canada, and Mexico. So yeah, I, I I am concerned about the trade outlook going forward more so than I have been in the past. Again, there's a long write-up uh, and all the details on that of what it might mean uh, for markets and across the different countries. Um, I would say that right now, trade relations are getting a little bit better. We've got uh, Anthony Blinken heading out, uh, you know, talking about trade policy with a few of our trade partners. China just dropped tariffs on Australian wine uh, late last year, early this year. So, I mean, there are some signs of, of things uh, uh Temperatures cooling a little bit, but I think as we go through the elections later this year and into next year, they might ramp right back up again. So that's another threat. The other thing tied to trade is, you know, shipping. And I, I've been talking about that a lot lately, uh, you know, seeing what's going on with uh, trade disruptions around the world can also add to shipping costs and inflation. You know, when assessing the Baltimore Bridge collapse, it's still early, but the disruption is likely to be focused on certain industries like U.S. vehicle imports, uh, Volkswagen, BMW uh, uh, coming into those. There could be shortages of, of some of those uh, cars and parts. Uh, coal exports from the U.S. could also be impacted, but already we're seeing some of that traffic being rerouted. Uh, New York, New Jersey ports alone have enough spare capacity to absorb it. Uh, I think if you take a look at uh, the number of containers we're talking about. And obviously there are differences in specialized equipment and things, but I think the traffic should be absorbed elsewhere. But, you know, we've got uh, a potential longshoreman strike at East and Gulf Coast ports later this year. 
uh, when the current contract is due to expire. Those negotiations have often reduced port throughput and resulted in delays. And of course, we've also got the uh, uh, all this adding to the supply chain challenges this year with the Suez and Panama Canal troubles. So all of these trade frictions and, and supply chain issues, I, I think, are going to remain a, a challenge this year and probably get potentially get worse as we move into the fall. Okay, we uh, you had mentioned uh, Europe and cars like BMWs. Uh, let's talk about, we have an interesting question here from one of our clients. Uh, China's seeming to be becoming the leader of like lower cost EVs. Do you, do you think in the, in the shorter medium term, that's going to be a problem for the German economy and hence the European economy if, if they kind of lose their leadership role in, in some of these uh, EVs, if we start really importing them from China? Yeah, I, there's a global competition here uh, in a new wave of, of, of electric vehicles. And, uh, you know, Germany, Germany both benefits and is hurt by it. Germany makes a lot of components that go into those cars. They're not all made within China. Uh, if you need exacting, uh, you know, engineering uh, equipment and tolerances uh, and those types of things. A lot of that's made in Germany. So Germany <clears throat> exports a lot of the equipment that goes into those vehicles. Um, <clears throat> so it benefits from from an overall trend in vehicle production, not just their end product. But sure, uh, there's global competition, and uh, you know those vehicles are getting cheaper. There's more and more uh, entries into lower and lower cost uh, uh, vehicles, and those are probably going to be more popular than than the ones we've seen for the last few years or last decade or so which have been relatively on the on the higher cost side so this could open up a, a new market for electric vehicles the lower cost side of things and uh could result in in a lot of uh, uh um market share growth. We'll have to see. I mean, I think that there are legitimate trade questions about uh whether those vehicles are are um uh, you know, it could conform to WTO rules, but we've kind of gutted the WTO. So it's very difficult to try to uh, uh, move anything through there and, and see whether, uh, uh, you know, China's benefiting from um, uh, uh, national subsidies that are uh, anti-competitive. So we'll have to see where all that goes. But yeah, I mean, I think we're in a world where there's a lot more competition here. At the same time, demand is weakened. And so that's a, a problem for car makers. Could be a bit of a challenge for Germany, but just you know, acknowledging there are a number of places in the world where we are actually seeing a lot of EV demand. Uh, by next year, I think China's uh, expected that half the vehicles they're producing are going to be electric vehicles. And again, you know, G German uh, uh, products and, and engineering goes into a lot of those cars. So there's there's some benefit to them there uh, whenever there's a rise in demand for autos, but certainly more competition as well. And we'll have to keep an eye on it. Uh, speaking about e EVs, a uh, uh, quick question. One of the reasons that's holding back EV adoption here in the U.S. is the lack of the charging infrastructure. Is that a problem in China? Uh, no, not as, not so much. Uh, China's got a lot of charging infrastructure. You know, this has been a national initiative to support that, and so uh, that is widespread across across China, at least across the eastern part of China, uh, where you're seeing that adoption take place. And so, uh, not really an issue. You know, when you've got one party government and they just decide they're going to do something, uh, they can roll that out fairly fairly quickly. So in the U.S., we've had a lot lot more challenge, I think, in rolling out that infrastructure. I know it's part of the plan. Uh, but those plans take a while with permitting and, and you know, all those kind of issues. So uh, it's, it's been much more rapid and not just in China. I mean, a number of countries have been very rapid in rolling that out. All right. Uh, what would you say the status is on the ADRs from China? Is there uh, the question is, is there a chance they would exit the U.S. trading based on uh, audits or not being allowed or gap? Not anymore. So that was addressed a year ago and, and the um, U.S. Uh, auditing oversight board has signed off that uh, the they are now able to get access to the auditor's records in China uh, and all, all that is no longer an issue. That was something that was held over these companies for years. Uh, they needed to open their audit books, not just their books, but their audited books to uh, to U.S. regulators 
um, accounting, uh, you know, audit overseers, if you will, and uh, they they did that. They there was one company uh, that they pulled back, uh, DD, which is a, a ride sharing company that they didn't want uh, U.S. auditors to have access to their books because uh, they could basically trace the movement of Chinese officials. Uh, it was sort of considered sensitive information uh, if uh, you know high ranking members of of China's Communist Party were able to be tracked. Uh, that way and so they pulled that 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 adr uh the rest of them are listed and all those uh uh not only the the statements but the the accounting the audits and then the audits all the records on the audits are available and uh, the us has signed off on that so there's no longer any risk that those adrs would be pulled from uh us markets all right and one final question and then we'll wrap up uh is there any chance that China would do direct investments in North America? That, that, that's the question. Uh, you know, China does do some FDI in the U.S., uh, you know, and, and it has for some time. We we tend to invest more in China than China does here for many different reasons. It's just a bigger market or a bigger, more rapid, rapidly growing consumer market over there, but they do. Uh, and so, you know, they're subject to a lot of oversight and control. What can they own and where do they own it? But uh, but they do have, have some involvement here in the U.S. and, and will probably continue to on a, a forward basis, even under – uh, whichever administration uh, is put in place in the future. There's some reasons why that makes some sense and to have that investment in the U.S. and production in the U.S. Uh, is, is a good thing. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me that that doesn't ramp up dramatically, uh, but uh, but there is some currently uh, taking place uh, generally, uh, you know, in, in areas that, uh, uh, you know, that are crucial to, uh, you know, to um, uh, a number of, of significant businesses in China that uh, are global in scope. All right. Well, thanks for your insights this week, Jeff. We really appreciate it. Our time is up. Uh, just a couple of closing words. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already by clicking the button to the lower right. You'll get updated when new content is posted. We want to thank Ken Rose in the chat for doing a workmanlike job, and we shall check you all later. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.